But, um, last week we talked about the story of Gideon, and I don't think we really got into the heart of that story, where the blood is pumping and uh, where it all flows from. So I want to go back to that. And um, there's something very significant for us here. I can't even totally put my finger on it, to be honest, but I have a sense that the story of Gideon is kind of like this, uh, this siren going off from heaven right now, okay? So I'll just kind of leave that with you. And, and, and anybody have a, have a, a smartphone where um, the Amber Alert will go off or like the National Weather Service sometimes? Like your phone just starts to freak out, you know? And you, it's like something like real... Real serious. I almost feel that right now on this on this this body on this the, the, this time. I feel that, but it's it's a good alarm. It's it's urgent, but it's it's good. So um so Jesus, tune us in, tune us in this morning to your heart. Tune us in to your presence. Tune us into what you're saying. Give us ears to hear, eyes to see from your word today. God, we receive all that you have for us. God, I pray, Father, that that all that is of you would penetrate, would be made clear, God. Anything that's not of you would just fall to the wayside. God, that your word would be exalted this morning, Father. Thank you um, for the presence of heaven. Thank you, God, that heaven is a reality around us. God, not far out in outer space, but it is around us. And I thank you for your ministering servants with us. I thank you for the angelic host that accompanies us and ministers to us as your children. Lord, I thank you that you release your angels, you release your presence in this room right now. Right now, Holy Spirit. Right now, release your glory. Thank you, Lord. Just join me in faith right now. Let him build your faith. Let him, let him build up your heart right now to receive the fullness of his word to you to receive empowerment. We don't want just another message. We want empowerment. We want something that brings change, that shifts the atmosphere around us. And his word can and will do that. So receive that right now, his glory, his presence. Heaven is all around us right now. Thank you, Father. We love you, God. Thank you for this time. Thank you for the fire in this place, God. Thank you for the fire of your presence. Amen. Amen. All right. I'm reading from Judges chapter 7, verse 1. It says, Then Jeroboam, that is Gideon, and all the people who were with him rose early and encamped beside the well of Harad, so that the camp of the Midianites was on the north side of them by the hill of Moreh in the valley. All right, let me set the stage for this because there's a big battle that's about to erupt. The Midianites were an enemy nation who had come into Israel and taken over. And not long after that, the people of God began to come into uh, extreme poverty, and they lived under this atmosphere of oppression and uh, fear and all of that. They became slaves in their own land. So the Midianites did all of this with an unstoppable army. Um, some estimates put their army at well over 100,000 men, which was a huge number for that time period, and the population at that time period. Uh, when you keep reading the story later on, it says that the army in that valley, it looked like the sand on the seashore. It looked like locusts covering the land, the earth. So you couldn't count them. It was too many. So this was an enemy that Israel had never faced before. And now Israel had mustered up a little courage through the leadership of this guy Gideon, who not that long ago was hiding out in his parents' basement. Well, it was more of a wine cellar, but you get the point. This was not a hero, and yet he was a hero because God told him that's who he was. So Gideon comes along and he rallies 32,000 people, which is a lot, but not compared to the Midianite army. 
Okay, so Gideon's army, they get together and they pitch their tents at this place called the Well of Herod. And I said last week that the name of that place is extremely telling because the word Herod literally means trembling or fear. So it's a good word picture of where the people are at. They're living in this place of great fear at this point in their history. And now they've pitched their tents literally at this place called the well of fear. Some of us have pitched our tents in the same place. We just kind of set up shop there and we get our tent pegs deep into the ground. And uh, we also, at times, we overlook a valley that is filled with things that we've not conquered before, enemies that we haven't faced before. Now, here's the thing about tents, though. In the Bible, tents are a symbol of temporary dwelling. So tents were a nomad's dwelling. They were not permanent structures. I want you to tell someone where I'm at is only temporary. Go ahead. Turn to the person next to you. Say I'm moving forward. I am not saying in this temporary thing that you haven't necessarily been in that place for what feels like not that temporary. Again, you might have put the stakes in quite deep, but that still doesn't make the tent permanent, okay? Because you're bound for glory. You are bound for glory. Your true home is the safety of the Father's heart. That's the truth. Yeah, it's okay to respond. It's good if you got something flowing there. This is good news, so why not respond to good news? Um, let's look at how God does this whole thing, okay? Let's go to the next verse. And the Lord said to Gideon, the people who are with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands, lest Israel claim glory for itself against me, saying, my own hand has saved me. Now, therefore, proclaim in the hearing of the people, saying, whoever is fearful and afraid, let him turn and depart at once from Mount Gilead. And 22,000 people returned, and 10,000 remained. Okay, so God says to Gideon, your army is too big. So if you guys win, you'll think you did it yourself. You'll fluff up your own pride, and pride will kill you quicker than a Midianite. So we got to deal with that first. So he says to Gideon, I want you to do the easiest altar call of your life. Invite everyone who's afraid to come up to the front and tell them they can go. And Gideon does it and loses two-thirds of his army. Probably, I think, a lot more than he expected. Um, now, I want you to think of what this would have been like, okay? Imagine for a moment that you're sitting on a hillside, a little elevated so you can look down over this army and, um, you know, just imagine yourself being the person who's, you know, helped organize this thing. And these are people that you've gathered to defeat this horrible evil in the north. And as you sit there, you begin to watch this huge swath of people begin to leave. Now, imagine it's just a couple hundred at first. Your heart might skip a few beats, but, you know, you've seen some miracles. You still got over 31,000 people there, you know, it's understandable. I could picture Gideon saying, all right, you know, God built this army, so all right. Um, thank you, God, that it won't be much more than this. Receive that by faith. <laughs> it's not going to be much more, Jesus. Start praying against what's happening. And then hundreds more start to go. And then a couple hundred more. And then all of a sudden, a wild patch of 1,000 people just start to leave. And um, when other people see that, they decide, okay, it's time to leave as well. So another thousand people leave. And you're just sweating at this, as this is happening, like hives are starting to break out kind of thing. Before long, 7,000 people are gone. Then another 7,000 people. Then six, somebody do the math for me. 
It's a lot. Whatever the number is, they peace out. Two-thirds gone. So you were outnumbered like four to one before, but now it's, it's like ten to one. Has anyone ever felt like you've watched things go that you found security in? Things that maybe brought you a sense of protection or comfort? You ever watch them make an exodus from your life? God will bring us through that kind of stuff. Um, were things we were trusting in to save us in some form or another get shaken up or sometimes get completely removed? Can anyone relate to this this morning? Where you're watching something that used to provide something to you begin to leave. Maybe... You know, it was like a stream of income that suddenly just, you know, starts to wash up. Something that used to bring the money in is just not coming in anymore. Maybe it was a relationship um, that began to change. Something you looked to for your happiness, for peace, and all of a sudden, it isn't the same anymore. Maybe that person's gone, or maybe they're not the same as they used to be. Maybe it's just a, a friendship that's not the same. Maybe it's a whole sense of community that you used to have that's no longer there. Um, I remember a very important person in my life that many of you know and still do know, she used to go to church here, Betty. My friend Betty, many of you remember Betty. Betty was a spiritual grandma to me. And um, for several years, she was this well of encouragement in my life. Every time this woman spoke a word from God to me, it came true. I've never had that happen with anyone else in my life. Every word she spoke to me was confirmed by God. And so often I came to her then for prayer and for encouragement, and I was thankful when the Holy Spirit would, you know, give her something to share with me. But then Betty, who had been widowed for a season, got remarried to someone who lived very far from here. And so she had to move, and I had to say bye, and I went through Betty withdrawals. And um, I know some of you can, can relate to this. Um, I wasn't able to connect with her in person anymore, and it was rough, you know? Now, I still talk to her over the phone, you know, love her immensely, but that personal well of encouragement, you know, is, is not, was not the same as it used to be. So in the months after her move, I had to trust the Father, to bring his word to me, okay? Not through one person, but through whoever or however he chose. And, you know, that matured me in many ways. Didn't feel good in the moment initially, but it brought maturity in my life. So maybe you're like Gideon today and you're sitting on that hilltop and you're looking at something huge in your life that's changing, that's leaving, or that's just not the same anymore. It is time to look up because your security was never really in those things, even the good things, okay? Your security is in him and he will be there long after those things are gone. Now, God is up to something very important here with Gideon. He's looking at Gideon and he's saying, do you really trust me? God is looking at us today asking the same question. Who do you trust in? Like really, like let me just pull you away into the secret place, no pretense, no faking it, just me and you. Who do you trust in? Now, hear me very clearly on this. God knows your true identity. When he asks that question, he knows the true answer. He knows that deep down you're a person of faith. When he asked that of Gideon, he already knew the answer, right? Because he called him a mighty man of valor in the beginning. You don't get that title unless there's some faith inside of you, even if you're living in the wine cellar at dad's house. When Gideon was hiding out, avoiding any and all conflict uh, with the enemy, far from being any kind of hero, God came to him and said, the Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. So God knows the answer. He knew deep down there was this rock trust in Gideon's soul. But here's the thing. Gideon didn't totally know that yet. 
God knows us better than we know ourselves. So it's, it's part of what's going on here. It's kind of like when Jesus asked Peter, do you love me? Do you remember that story? I was at the beach where that happened in Israel last year, last uh, October. One morning, Jesus made breakfast for the boys, set up a campfire, cooked up some fish. This was like a week or so after his resurrection. Now, before that, a week or so prior, right before Jesus' gruesome death, Peter, who was his right-hand man, had utterly and blatantly denied Christ. Three times. At a time when you could say that his friend, his teacher, needed him the most, Peter utterly failed Christ, completely rejected him publicly with curses, swear words in it. And so Jesus rises from the dead, comes back, finds Peter and the gang fishing. If anybody fishes, you might know some of this, where you're fishing maybe after a long week or a bad situation, and it's, it's more of that like under a cloud, just wallowing in it, just trying to zone out. I'm, a, I'm sure that's a little bit of what was going on here, some degree of guilt and depression, and, and Jesus interrupts their, their, uh, their little fishing trip and, and says, come on, come to the shore, we're going to have breakfast. This is one of my favorite stories, by the way, in the Bible. He makes breakfast and he invites Peter into the conversation. And he looks at Peter and the memory is still fresh and painful in Peter's mind. And Jesus asks Peter, do you love me? Now, Jesus knew the answer, but he wanted Peter to discover it himself. He wanted Peter to say it. Now, this could have um, sounded condemning if you read it from the wrong lens. You could read this and you can hear it like, Peter, do you love me? Like, you know, like a, like a tone of resentment. You know what I'm talking about. But that didn't exist in the heart of Jesus. So he asked Peter the question and Peter said to him, yes, I do love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. In other words, move forward. He affirms his leadership and his calling, but then he asks Peter the same question a second time and says, Peter, do you love me? Now, depending on how you read this as well, if you don't really know the heart of our Lord, you could, again, read some, maybe some suspicion in his tone of voice. Do you love me? Like second-guessing. Or I'm really just setting you up to slap you in front of everybody, you know? But that wasn't in the heart of our Lord. Not a hint of suspicion. He's looking into his soul. He's like looking into him, like through him, right? And ask the question. And, um, and Peter says to him, yes, Lord, I do. But then comes the third time. Jesus asks this question a third time. And by the third time, it says that Peter's heart broke. And the truth comes out probably as raw and as vulnerable as it ever had been. And he looks at his Lord and his friend, and he says to him, Lord, you know all things. You know the truth. Yes, I do love you. I really do. That stupid thing I did the other night, that wasn't my heart. And I was afraid, and I lost focus, but that's not who I am. I'm a man who loves you, a man who's faithful. That's who I am. I'm a rock, Peter the rock, by your grace. And there it was. Jesus, that's what he was getting at and prying and asking those questions. So when God comes to you and he asks some tough questions, like, do you trust me? And you're struggling, and maybe in that moment you realize, you look back on your last week, it couldn't have been as bad as Peter's, let me tell you. Trust me, not a soul in this room, I could imagine. But you think back, and you say, man, I don't know. Have I, I don't think I've really been trusting in him. I've been trusting in others. I've been trusting in money, in the bank account. I've been trusting in myself. 
I'm trusting even in good things like maybe my family or my church or whatever, but not necessarily you. And, but he will keep asking that question until we look a little bit deeper and we see in our hearts and we can say it with our own lips and say, you know what? Yes, Lord, I do. I do trust you. I know I do. And that's where God wants to bring us, you know, where we can say to ourselves that truth. That's called humility, by the way. It's, it's agreeing with God. All right, so I wish I could say that was the only challenge that came to Gideon. Like God brought him through that moment, stripped him of 22,000 people, and now with an army of 10,000, they go out into the battlefield and face the greatest enemy of their history. But that would not be the full story, would it? Anybody know this story? Yeah, it's not over, right? Okay, so um, there's one more period of stripping away of pruning that happens here at the well of Harad in verse 4. Oh, all right, I'm going to have to read it to you. This is verse 4 of chapter 7. The Lord said to Gideon, the people who are still too many, bring them down to the water, and I will test them there for you. Then it will be that of whom I say to you, this one shall go with you, the same shall go with you. And of whom ever I say to you, this one shall not go with you, they won't go with you. So God is saying, I'm going to separate the people for you in a moment. And here's what you're going to do. So he brought the people down to the water and the Lord said to Gideon, everyone who laps from the water with his tongue, like a dog laps, you shall set apart by himself. Likewise, everyone who gets down on his knees to drink the water, you'll separate, set apart. Verse six, and the number of those who lapped, putting their hand up to their mouth, was 300 men. But all the rest of the people got down on their knees to drink the water. Then the Lord said to Gideon, by the 300 men who lapped, I will save you and deliver you and deliver the Midianites into your hands. Let all the other people go, every man to his place. All right, really strange story going on here. Gideon is told by God to test his men by watching them drink the water, according to how they drink the water. Some get to stay then, and some are told to leave. Now, a question for you. What water are they drinking from? They're drinking right from where their tents are pitched. So they're drinking from the well of fear. Remember, that's the literal name of this place. So God has Gideon separate the people according to how they respond to fear. 9,700 people bend their knee to it. 300 people bring the water up to their mouth, and in doing that, they remain standing. That's a picture of encountering fear, but not yielding to it. Okay, both groups were drinking from the same water. They were both drinking from the well of trembling. And the fact is that those 300 men, they were afraid too. They needed encouragement. When you get to the actual battle, you'll see Gideon himself still needed like confirmations and signs from God to move forward. So you can be afraid. You can encounter fear. But the question is, will you bow your knee to what the fear is telling you? Will you let it rule you? Or will you let the greater truth that you are a beloved child of God be the measure of your life? Will you let fear cause you to abandon your destiny, to abandon the adventure and the grace that God has called you to? That's the question that's on the table here, where the alarm is going off. Because there's a Midianite army out there. There's darkness and there's oppression and poverty, and God is preparing us to step out as children of light. 
because there's great things ahead of us. And so he's teaching us very strategically, very lovingly, how to respond to fear. And so God says to Gideon at the end of this exchange, let all the other people go. Let everything else go, Gideon. Let everything that is not of me go. And all that was left was 300. Now, in the Bible, numbers have meaning. The number three is a big one. Three, as in 300, represents the divine number. It is the number of the Trinity. It speaks to the divine nature, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Do you know that there is an army of 300 inside of us? In other words, there's a divine nature within us. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit dwell inside completely. The problem is, is that there's 31,700 other voices bickering, trying to distract us from the truth where we lose sight of the rock-solid 300. But guess what? The 31,700 is not you. It's voices and it's old lies trying to control the real you. And you know what? They get exposed when we go through stuff. You know, the beauty of difficult circumstances is that they have this edge to them like a pruning hook. And this edge has the ability to eliminate more and more of the 31,700 in your thinking. And every time you go through something difficult, more gets sliced, those voices begin to lose authority in your mind, in your heart, because you've made it through. And you've discovered more of God. You've built a testimony as you've gone through that situation. And I know the testimonies in this room. I know the growing testimonies that God has done in your life as you've chosen to say yes to move forward. It's a hook that continues to whittle down and remove everything that's standing you from the ultimate destiny God has for you. And you're getting closer and closer to it all the time. You guys... Still with me? If you can see the beauty of that edge, you will bear more patiently, and, and can I say it, more joyfully, in the midst of difficulty, because you know that little by little, these 31,700 complainers are leaving. They get loud in the moment, don't get me wrong, ah! as the slice goes through. But... They fade as we stand and we don't bow the knee to them. And here's what gives us a lot of joy, okay? That army of 300 will be there no matter what. No matter what. So think about it. Those 300 men, they were there from the beginning, right? Right? right from when they arrived at the well of Harad, even when the army was trembling and had no idea what to do, those 300 were in their midst all along, maybe scattered throughout the 32,000. Listen, God is going to be there regardless with you. Even when 10,000 other voices are acting up, bending the knee to the things of this world. So right now you might feel comfortable in the tent, and you might have made your home there, feeling overwhelmed by the enemy, you know, facing things you've never faced before, thinking of giving up. Maybe you are giving up, but God in you is not giving up. He's with you today, and he is your true identity because you're complete in him. Colossians 2 says that you are filled with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They will never desert you and never leave you. People might leave you. All right, things in this world will change. Money may get shaky at times, relationships rocky, but the Father, the Son, and the Spirit of God, they will walk with you. They've covenanted to do so, no matter how much of a mess you make of things too. 
They will walk through the mud with you. They've got boots on that extend to the highest heavens. They'll walk right through your mess and tread down everything that causes you to be afraid and stay at your side no matter what because they've made a covenant. They've made a promise by blood that can never be shaken. And they will be all that remains. All that remains. They will be all that remains at the end of your life. So we might as well go on and get on with embracing that, huh? We should, huh? You can't take anything else with you. Okay, so now in the story, Gideon with his 300 men are going to face down the enemy and experience a true miracle. Are you ready to get into that? Good, we'll come back next week. Let's pray.